opening up the section on rate expressions and then we'll move on to the next section we've done multiple equations and multiple reactions. So last time we were looking at rate expressions, remember the goal here is to estimate minus R which is K and the alpha for example. We're looking at because if I go repeat this batch at a different temperature, I will get different values of CA against time. I will get a different slope. So I'll end up actually with something that looks as follows. I'll be plotting time against CA naught of the CA. Take a log of that. So for one system, I might get that sort of approach. So this is at T1. And the next time I repeat this, I'll get a different set of data. At T2. And I can repeat it perhaps a third time and get something slightly different. At a third temperature. So very quickly now I've established what the rate constant Ka is at three different temperatures by doing three pretty straightforward experiments. Okay. This is good, this is an excellent approach to follow if I already know what alpha is. Okay. And when we look at last class, we can also uh, repeat this. Assuming that in alpha, I will simply get different expressions plot on my y-axis. My x-axis is always time, my y-axis is the value that always changes. But once I've figured out what order the system is, first, second, zero, or so forth, it's easy to repeat experiments and get different slopes every time for each rate expression. So that's the integral approach that we learned about last class. We pretty much finished on that step. As I said, yeah, it's less sensitive to error, and the main reason for that is because the data set, all the data are used to calculate that slope, and so it evens out. So sometimes you're going to be a little bit of error above, sometimes a little bit below, but as long as you're not systematically always above or always below, you're going to, those errors are going to cancel out and you're going to get a pretty reasonable estimate of the slope and get a good rate expression, Ka. The method we're going to learn about tonight is called the differential method. That's the second one. 
the advantage of the differential method is that you don't need to guess alpha. We're going to be able to estimate alpha at the same time as we estimate our rate constant, k. Okay. So we're going to get two things going, two estimates in one go. There's no guess and check, guess and check, guess and check involved in the differential method. Let's just make a note of that. Method two. It's going to use, no surprise, the derivative, which is where the name comes from, the differential method. If you're looking this up in textbooks, it's probably in 2011, you find this in section 7.4. In fact, the whole of chapter 7 is related to this method of um, finding the rate expressions. Or if you've got an older version of Bogler, 2006, this would be in section 5.2-1. So he's going to rearrange it a little bit to the new version. But basically, chapter 5 is all about rate expressions in chapter 7. And the other. So the, the differential method follows this approach. It says for a batch reactor again, we have DCA by DT. And we're going to assume that my rate expression is Ka Ca to the L for A going to quadrants. So same rate expression as before, two unknowns, Ka and L. sub in here, that would imply that minus dCA by T is equal to Ka Ca to the other. of both sides, it's perfectly valid to do that. It might be surprising, but yes, we can take the log of a differential equation. So we'll take the log of left and right. Minus dCA dt is equal to log of Ka plus alpha <coughs> why this method works now, at estimating both rate expressions, or rate constants for us in one go. So if I treat the log of the derivative as my y is equal to my intercept plus a slope x is log of ca, my y is this log of dca by dt. So take the negative dca by dt slope of the concentration with respect to time, take the log of that. So let's uh, just try to put this in, get a, another picture going here, just to visualize what the system is doing. take my batch reactor and I think what CA is doing with time, I fill my batch with CA. At time zero I've got a concentration CA naught and I'm plugging CA over here. My batch concentration
concentration in the reactor is depleting with time. DCA by DT represents the rate of change of concentration with respect to time. So here, at some time, I, I get a particular slope. So right at the beginning of my batch, I get a particular slope of concentration of time. Then that slope changes further on in the batch. That slope is something different. Near the end of the batch, that slope is less steep. So these slopes represent ECA by DT. But it's always going to be negative slopes. So if I take the negative of that slope, that rhymes ECA by DT. Remember, I can't take a log of a negative value here. So I have to take the negative ECA by DT. So it's a negative slope multiplied by minus 1 gives me a positive value guaranteed inside this log function. I'm going to plot that on my y axis. I'm going to plot on the x axis CA concentration easily measured. My intercept is going to be the rate of constant log, and my slope is going to be the reaction of the alpha. I'm going to estimate both quantities in one row. Small problem. How do I get DCA by DT? artificial representation of what we expect based on our theory, what I really only have are raw data. Raw data taken at a particular point in time. So I know I would know my initial concentration, and I know my concentrations at other points in time. So here yeah, the green points represent raw actual data. The red line is not available to me. So how would I estimate my slope? to your advantage here. And this one thing I do actually really want to stress. We have this tendency, unfortunately, I did the same thing in my undergraduate, to see our courses independent of each other. But there's a reason why we structure the courses the way we do, right? Uh, the courses structure here at Mac has been about the same structure in chemical engineering for the past 25 to 30 years. The reason is because it works. And there's a lot of logic to it, and carefully designed by professors way back then. I know some of them, and we, I've had discussions with them and asked them, so why did you sequence the order in a particular way? And they've explained their reasons, and it makes sense. So when you take a course, reactor design, don't see it as independent of numerical methods or independent of process control. Or next year when you take 4N, 4N relies heavily on reactor design. So when I teach you 4N, we're going to draw on the concepts of reactor design quite substantially. So, it's not a bad thing to think about your previous courses and use the tools from those courses in this course. So absolutely, splines would be a perfect way to do that and take the derivatives of those splines. Any other techniques you might think of? Yeah, let's take a look at an example of a pretty screwed approach. It works, it has some error involved with it. But for the most part, we'll get a reasonable answer. So I'll introduce the method by example. Let's take data, time, and this is measured in minutes. This example isn't a textbook if you want to refer to it later, though I've changed the unit somewhat. So I measured time. I measure concentration in moles per meter cube. And then what I'm going to do here in the next column over is estimate minus delta CA over delta T. So we're going to estimate that derivative 
And if my raw data is the following, so when you write this in your notebook, you probably want to leave some generous space between each of the lines. So 0, 50, 100, 150. There's a bit more data, but I, I, I don't want to fit it all in here. So let's assume my initial concentration was 50 moles per meter cubed. 50 minutes into the batch, I measure a concentration of 38. Then I measure 30.6. Then I measure 25.6. And again, I'll continue on the table in the next 40 minutes. So what this approach does, this differential approach, is it estimates that derivative numerically simply as the deltas between successive readings in your table. So Fogler, Fogler does the following. He draws these kind of uh, triangles on the side. So we would write minus dCa by dt, estimate that as negative, 38 minus 50 divided by 50 minus 0. Okay, and write that as 2.4. The next pair I can use to estimate the same slope. So in this case it's uh, minus 30.6 <coughs> minus 38 over 100 minutes minus 50. Concentration then was 25.6 for the first menstrual, then But really this is not. From a numerical methods point of view, you, you would learn, or for those of you that are going to take the course still, that this derivative estimate of 0.24 is a good estimate of the derivative at the center point, so halfway between 0 and 50. But it's not a good estimate of the derivative either at 0 or at 50. Okay, so it's the average derivative between times 0 and 50. So it's probably a good estimate midway. The problem is, remember, our objective here is to plot the log of the derivative against the log of the concentration. I don't know the log of the concentration midway. 
And you, saying that it's a linear decrease and interpolating halfway is not a good estimate because we know that this declines exponentially. And the whole purpose of this exercise is to find the rate of exponential decay. So really, we cannot say this derivative of 0.24 belongs to this first row or to the second row. It belongs to somewhere in the middle. So what we do then is we plot the data up. And this is, again, where this method gets messy and breaks down, which is why I said at the beginning it's a little bit more error prone. So what you would do is construct the following in your notebook. You would construct this in your notebook with far less error than I'm going to do on the board here, because I don't have grids to work with. But essentially, you, you draw evenly spaced points on your page. I'll try my best here. So 50, 100, 200, 250, 300. And you draw those bars at the heights given by those points. So if that's an estimate of the derivative about midway between, you draw your bar at about 2.4. So this point is about 2.0, um, uh, not 2.0. is drawn at 100, spanning the range from 50 to 100 at a height of about 0.15. So 0.24 is up there, 0.15 is going to be about here. The next one is at 0.1, so that's 0 0.24, 0 0.1 is about here. Span the space from the first point to the second point. And we're saying that those are good estimates of the slopes roughly at the midpoint, so let's just draw guides for ourselves at those midpoints. And what we go do then is estimate this slope by drawing a best fit line using your eye. <coughs> this is why this method breaks down a bit and it's error prone through those midpoints over there. The final step then is to actually estimate minus dCA by dt. So we add the fourth column now onto our table, where we read off that slope. This is a plot of dCA by dt here on my y-axis against time on the x-axis. So I omitted to write this here earlier, so let's update my x-axis is time, my y-axis is minus dCA by dt. So I can go read all then at time zero, my best estimate of the slope, the negative slope coefficient. I can go read all at time 50. So let's pay attention where we read off here. At time 50, I go to where that red line intersects 50, and I go read off that value. At time 100, I go read off that value, and so forth. Okay, so read off the arrow values. So at time zero, if you do this construction corresponding to the data roughly at time zero, you get a value of 3 point, uh, you get a value of 0.3. At time 50, 
you get a value of about 1.85 uh, at time 100, 0.12, at time 200, 0.08. <laughs> If I continue on then at time 150, we got 0.08, and I would get 0.05, and then finally 0.045. We don't get a value for the last row in our table. We could, we could read it all, but it's just here so, so, so close, like that. So it's pretty much flat. I, you, you draw it to scale. So you draw it on a computer or you draw it, do it on a graph table. So we know how high those bars need to be. 0.24, that's the value right here over there. So it's, that's why I've written the values over here. Because I can't, I mean, I'm doing my best estimate to show you a rough proportion. This is what the graph would generally look like. I did do it to scale in my notebook, but it's transcribing it up here on the board is going to be tough. Okay, so I'm almost there. I've got minus DCA by DT now. I've got CA, so I can go do that final step, which is where we plot and estimate the least squares model. So it was minus log of DCA by DT is equal to the log of KA plus my alpha, the order of the rate, of the rate expression, times the So I've got minus dCA by dt here, I've got CA over here, you take the log of CA and plot it. In this example, you would then take your data into Excel, or into R, or MATLAB, and you fit the best model you can. So I'll just write, write the result. Um, did everyone get this data or did I erase it too early? Okay, got it. So just the, the answer, if you want to go test this in Excel, I'll write it Excel or MATLAB. You then go estimate alpha. In this case, you get a value of two points. 08 I think it was, and Ka you get a value of 0 0.0009. So I get, the, the key point here is that you get both your rate constant Ka and you get your alpha, the slope, in one, one go. So I know now this is a second order rate constant, so second order uh, rate equation. You will never get it to identically over here, so we simply round, so 2, and my rate constant Ka, so I could then minus Ra is equal to Ka, Ca to the 2. I've got all the information I need now, and I can go use the rate, that rate term in dividing the future reactions. So is the approach, the sequence we followed pretty clear? So I go to Excel and I regress. This is my y variable, and this is my x variable. Slope is equal to alpha. Intercept is equal to log of ka. Yeah. You don't set your intercept. You, you tell Excel to find the intercept and the slope. Okay, so a regular regression between this x and this y, the slope will be the alpha, and your intercept will be log of k. So if I've given conversions, I always have ca naught, or I have no yeah. ca naught, so you can yeah. actually help it with ca. is on the course website, yeah. I don't have my computer here to show you, but it's, it's all on the website. Yeah. So if you 
you've got the statistics toolbox, it's really easy. If you don't have the statistics toolbox, it's about three or four extra lines of work. Or maybe a bit more. But, yeah. Or you can use Octave. Octave is the code on the website. You can use Octave. Octave is free, the equivalent of MATLAB. It should work in Octave. I haven't tested it, but it's usually Octave code, a uh, MATLAB code plugged straight into Octave works with no modification. And all the toolboxes in Octave are free as well. Okay, any any other issues or questions on this differential?